This is the day of the Lord's victory. Let us be happy. Let us celebrate. May God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's sing together hymn number 619. For you today to honor you as God. We come waiting for your spirit to inspire and fill us. May we receive all that you would give with open hearts and minds. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
We want to welcome you all to worship today. We're glad you could be with us. Today we have a guest speaker, Elder Gerard Kimene is our region director here at the uh, LA Metro region of the Southern California Conference. He's been our director, was it 21 years now? 21. 21, Ooh, okay. <laughs> He's my boss. <laughs> And uh, I'll introduce you to his boss, his wife Diane, I think is back here in the corner. Glad you could be with us today too. And all other guests, we're delighted to have you. Good to see some old friends here again. Kathy, Titus, it's been a few years since you stopped by. Glad to see you back today. But God bless you as we worship today. And uh, take note of the announcements in the bulletin. There's some important things. I'd like to invite Doug Werner up to talk about our, our new Wednesday night program called Koinonia. I didn't think he was your boss anymore. I thought you retired. <laughs> Good morning. Happy Sabbath, church family. For several weeks now, there has been an announcement in the bulletin and special announcements from the platform about a new Wednesday night program called Koinonia. You may be asking yourself, what in the world's Koinonia? Is that some kind of coin collecting club? Well, Koinonia is a Greek word that occurs about 20 times in the Bible. Uh, Koinonia's primary meaning is fellowship, sharing in common and communion. The first occurrence of Koinonia is in Acts 2.42, where it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, and fellowship is Koinonia, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Fellowship is a key aspect of the Christian life. Believers in Christ are to come together in love, faith, and encouragement. Koinonia. Philippians 2, 1 and 2 declares, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship, if any koinonia with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Koinonia is being in agreement with one another, being united in purpose, and serving alongside each other in our common relationship with Jesus Christ. A powerful example of what koinonia should look like can be found in a study of the phrase one another in the Bible. Just look at this list that scripture commands us to do for one another. That is what true biblical koinonia looks like. Now, it's nigh unto impossible for our large church family to truly accomplish most of this list as we gather here for our worship service Sabbath mornings. We are just too big of a group for true intimacy. The church worship service is a one-way communication from the platform to the audience. That doesn't match up with the one another list, as beautiful and spiritually fulfilling as our worship service is. Our Sabbath school classes come a little closer, being smaller in size. There's some sharing, but usually the focus is on the lesson study. And so again, the one another list of true koinonia usually isn't adequately addressed. Other groups in our church family, uh, such as the choir, the bell choir, women's ministry, hospitality team, um, hospital singing bands, etc., do provide an opportunity for community to happen, but probably miss out on the studying together component, which is a huge part 
of the admonishing and encouraging one another components of koinonia. So a few years ago, recognizing our need for something more, we began the growth group program here at Vallejo Drive Church, where small groups of like-minded members could meet together to fellowship, pick a topic and study together what God's word has to say about it. And as our groups have met together over these last several years, sharing the joys and cares of each other's lives, bonds of fellowship, trust, and love have formed, resulting in their being koinonia. In other words, these groups have become a setting in which they could truly be a community of other-centered love. This new Wednesday night program that we have named Koinonia is starting here on the church campus in the chapel Wednesday night, September 6th, that's a week from this coming Wednesday night, at 6.45 p.m. It is really the result of our listening to what many of you have said to us when you've been invited to join a group. Things like, the home that group meets in is just too far away, I can't, I, I, it's too far to travel. Um, or, I can't afford a babysitter. So families with children, we are exploring the possibility of having free childcare provided. And if you need it, please let myself or one of the pastoral staff know. We decided to hold it here at the church campus because if it's not too far to come on Sabbath, it probably isn't too far to come on Wednesday night. It will start with some light refreshments then two or three songs of worship together, a brief introduction to the study topic for that evening, and then we'll break out into small groups. And at the end of the group time, we'll all come back together again for a, a, a time of prayer. There will be several groups to church choose from, and initially, feel free to try any of them to see which one is a fit for you. All we ask is that after a few weeks, you settle on one. So please make plans to add koinonia to your life. And I thank you. Thank you. That's just one week from Wednesday night, so it's coming up soon. Hope to see you there. Did want to mention, uh, for the sake of your prayers, every week after the first, or every year after the first week of school. Uh, the Eagle Rock Church and our church together honor our teachers and uh, all of our teachers are gone and their families over there today because every year uh, on this date there's a group of, there's usually about 40 or 50 teachers that are there that are honored uh, and so remember our teachers remember our school it's a time where we need to call on God and ask a blessing for them for this year so keep them in mind thank you Will the deacons please come forward? Today we have the opportunity to give to future generations. It's for conference-worthy students.
Dear Heavenly Creator, as we come to worship the Sabbath, we thank you for your endless love for each of us. With the love of Jesus, we can surrender our selfish selves to you to transform us into what you designed us to be, people who choose to serve each other. We thank you for this immediate opportunity to serve each other and provide for these worthy students. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we remain standing, the children can come down, please, for the story, and we'll greet each other and welcome each other for Sabbath. Hi, it's nice to see all of you. So today, we have a guest speaker at our church. And he's going to talk about a story that I know all of you already know, but some stories, even though we know them, we can keep discovering new things about them, right? So I have a question for you before I get into my story. Which of you has a very tall dad? Or maybe a tall brother? Some of you have tall dads, tall brothers? Let me ask the congregation for a second. Anybody here 6'1"? Come on, don't be shy. How about you, Pastor Batiste? 6'1"? 6'4"? OK, 6'4". Can anybody beat that? Anybody taller than 6'4"? OK. Would you be my volunteer, please? <laughs> Thank you. Pastor Batiste, right? OK. So hello. <laughs> uh, kids, this is Pastor Batiste. He's going to be my volunteer. He's 6'4". Now I'm going to ask Pastor Batiste to hold this. Let me see, above your head, maybe. Yeah, that looks about right. Now, could you turn it around so the kids can see the face on the other side? Now, don't look at Pastor Batiste's face, all nice and smiley and friendly. Look at the face up there. Now, what would you say if Pastor's, Batiste, uh, Pastor's head was all the way up there? Is he tall, really tall, or gigantic? What do you think? Tall? Gigantic? Okay, so there was a person in our story that was that tall. That's a good hint. Does anybody know what story I'm talking about? I see Oxwell. What do you think? Who is that? Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. I'm sure God is probably even bigger than that. But no, it's not Jesus. Did you, can you guys think of somebody else? See, Gio? Goliath? Yes. Do you guys remember the giant Goliath? He was that tall, all the way up there. Now, what if I would tell you, okay, pick one of you to come fight our giant, and if you win, we all go to Disneyland. But if you lose, we all have to, let me see, eat broccoli, and then take a nap, and then go dig, dig some ditches. How does that sound? No? Yeah, I like broccoli too, so that doesn't always work, but <laughs> okay, so let me see. What if I tell you only one of you can come and fight him, but then if that person loses, all of you have to be slaves. 
Wouldn't that be a little scary? Like, who do we choose? Which one is the biggest out of you? I'm looking at you. Maybe Giovanni? Come here, Gio. Stand up. What if I tell you Giovanni's going to fight him? What do you guys think? What if we give Giovanni an armor? Here you go, Gio. Put this on. Put that on you. Okay. How about now? You guys feel a little safer? No? Not yet? How about if I give Gio a sword? You guys feel a little safer if he fights him? Are you sure? How about a helmet? No? Still no? Helmet's broken. <laughs> okay, how about now? No? Still no? I know. It's kind of scary to fight a giant. I don't care if you have an armor, a sword, or no armor. Thank you, Gio. Can you put it on the seat? Thank you. So, when we go out today, every day in our life, we don't get to see giants like Goliath. We don't fight giants down this street, right? But you know which ones are our giants? Our giants, like even bigger than this sometimes, are our fears. Sometimes we're scared of things, or maybe our anger. Sometimes we get really, really mad, and we feel like doing something mean to our brothers or our sisters or other kids. Or maybe mommy and daddy have an argument, and we feel really scared or really sad. So those are our giants. And when David, in the Bible, went to fight Goliath, he didn't go alone. He went with God. And our God is the God of angel armies. And for each giant in our life, whether it's fear or anger or sadness, whatever it is that we have to go against, God is right there. Okay? So I want you to say thank you to our giant. <laughs> thank you, Pastor Vati. <laughs> And I want you to remember that it doesn't matter what you are going through this week, whether it's something scary or something that makes you upset, you can always think God is right here to help me out. Okay? That's the end. No children's worship today, so go back to your parents. Children's worship is coming back soon. Okay, bye. Well, the kids are going back. I want to remind those of you who are members of the pastoral search committee that we're going to meet uh, about 10 minutes after the service today up in the senior pastor's office, right after the service today, members of the pastoral search committee. And I want to welcome to the organ today, Vinny Jaros, our own member who's playing. <laughs> Give her a warm welcome.
Those of you who, are, who have a burden to present to God specifically, please come forward as we sing seven, 671. of you in the pew, let us kneel. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning. You have heard the offering of special music, the offering of our tithes and offering. Now we offer ourselves that we may hear your word to, through our pastor, Pastor Kimini. We thank you for the opportunity to listen to you. Father, also we want to thank you for the opportunity for bringing us here today to worship you. There are many who have issues. It may be health. It may be looking for a job. Some have come forward with special needs and special requests. We ask that you will listen to them right now. Father, answer their prayers. And may they realize that you are indeed their father. Father, we also have a request for Rick Shorter and his family, his wife Gwen. Rick presently is ill and he needs your hand as a physician to heal him. We pray for those in the audience who have requests that were not mentioned earlier. We ask that you will answer those requests. We also pray for our nation who is going through many different turmoils. We know that salvation is through Jesus Christ. And as we study in Galatian, the only thing that we need to know about the gospel is that Jesus is our key, Jesus is our author and finisher of our faith. Continue to bless us as we worship you this day. We ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. morning church family this morning's scripture is found in the book of first Samuel 1726 it is also found in the front of your bulletin and I'll be reading from the new revised standard version and it says this your servant has killed both lions and bears and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them since he has defied the armies of the living God
Happy Sabbath. You know, I must confess to you, I didn't understand a word that was set up on the platform. It's incredible. If you're on the platform, you don't know what people are saying. So I assume, Mark, that you were saying some nice things about me. I'm not sure. Yeah, I didn't think so, because the people were grimacing as I was looking over. Um, anyway, it is great to be at Vallejo Drive, amen? Man, every time I come to this place, I get hugs and, 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 and handshakes and welcome and everything else. I mean, this place is so friendly, you know. You just are, are, are so fortunate that you are able to worship here. Um, so before we begin, let's pray. Our Father God, this is the day that you have made. This is a precious day, Lord. Let us not, not take it for granted because you created it just with us in mind. Lord, we've come here to worship you and to be inspired through your spirit. May we hear you speaking to us and may we leave this place invigorated with confidence knowing that we serve a mighty God. We ask now that your spirit will lead us in worship as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So let me begin by asking a question. Hi, Jim. How are you? How is everybody? You know, we have this concept of happy Sabbath, right? Happy Sabbath where we get up and we're just raring to go to church. Amen. 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 Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, amen. However, the truth is, truth be told, that sometimes before we get to church, uh, our life is not so, so peaceful as we would like it to be, amen? We come uh, to church with issues on our mind, and especially the world today. I mean, uh, there are so many things happening in this world today that it would not be unusual for us to have s some anxiety about what's going on on this planet right now. However, sometimes the cares of this world so consume us that the idea of having one more thing to do just seems to paralyze us, even going to church. You know, uh, the story is told one Sabbath morning, a woman woke her husband up and she said, honey, it's time to go to church. And she prodded him, get up, get up. And he looked at her and he said, sweetheart, I just don't feel like it. No, not today. And she said, no, you've got to go. He said, you can't make me. Give me one good reason why I should go to church. And she said, sweetheart, you're the pastor. Now we laugh at that, but I will tell you, sometimes I've gotten up that way. Do I really have to go to church? I met this greeter at the Temple City Church. I came early, and she was there very modestly dressed, obviously not a person of means. However, I saw something in her eye that was a twinkle. You know what I mean? Just a, a twinkle of happiness, a twinkle of peace. And so I said to her, you know what? Uh, uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? And she said, uh, well, uh, I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to get to the Temple City Church. I said, 5 o'clock in the morning? Where do you live? And she said, oh, I really don't live that far. The thing is, I have to take the bus. And by the time I make all the transfers, it takes me 
around two and a half hours to get to church every Sabbath. And I said to her, why do you do that? Aren't there any closer churches to you? And she said, yes, there are closer churches, but I come here because I want to get that message of hope. Isn't that incredible? She said, I live in a very stressful neighborhood, uh, a lot of violence there, and I need that message of hope to get me through. And she said, on top of that, you know what? When I ride that bus on the way to church, I pray to God, Lord, help me to find somebody who I can talk to. And she says, many times I meet a stranger who is down and out, and I just share with him the good news of Jesus. Amen? And, and it just invigorates me. Even though it takes me that long, I am just happy to be here. Um, now, perhaps this morning, you've come here with some giants on your shoulders. Amen? You know, I know we put on our Sabbath best, right? We're all dressed up. We look good, smell good, and everything else. But some of us are carrying burdens. Isn't that true? The burden of a career loss. The burden of a troubled relationship. The burden of bitterness. The burden of frustration, of disappointment at yourself, the burden of not being able to forgive someone that you have, have harbored malice at, the burden of addictions that you may have tried to overcome for years in your life. I have good news for you this morning. For those of you who came home or came here on a bus or you walked or you drove your car, there is what I call the drive home point. And you know what the drive home point is? It's the point that you're thinking about when you're what? Driving home. And here's the point. In Jesus' name, you can slay your giant. Oh, let me say that again. I don't think you were listening. In Jesus' name, you can slay your giant. And the church said, Amen. Amen. That's what I thought you were saying. You know, sometimes we make way too much of our giants. And so I wanted to review with you a little bit about the giant Goliath, you know, that's found in first, in chapter 17 of Samuel, first 17. Now this guy was like 10 feet tall. He was a mature warrior. He was boastful and he had that boast on the basis of his experience of being able to decimate anyone who came against him. And he did this for 40 days and 40 nights. You know, do you have a giant like that in your life that seems to, uh, to badger you day in and day out. Anybody want to raise your hand? I've got mine up. Oh, man, I've got some giants in my life sometimes. And so the first thing I learned out of my own experience here is that we have got to quit telling our God about the power of our giants and begin to tell our giants about the power of our ominous, empowering God. Amen? 
See, the messages at times that we give to God is like, this is so hopeless. In fact, we are suggesting to God, I don't think you can do anything about this. I guess I just have to live with this giant. And so we walk around intimidated and defeated as if that's just our lot in life. Now, let me say this right now. I love young people, young teenagers, because really this is one message where the older people will learn from the younger. Amen? And so anyway, the older people were saying, you know, look at this guy. He's a man of experience. He's never lost a battle. Man, this guy is humongous. And here he's coming against the children of God. And all he's saying is that bring somebody out to defeat me and you win. But if I win, then you will be enslaved. And Saul and the children of Israel looked at this guy and saw him as an immovable foe. And then up walks this young man named David, who was no more than a teenager. He really wasn't. No more than a teenager. And rather than seeing an immovable foe, he saw a big target. Isn't that incredible? A big target. See, he addressed him and he said, you are nothing but an uncircumcised Philistine. That's what you are. Isn't that incredible? Now, was he willing to put his action behind his words? Mark, was he willing to do that? Because, see, he engaged and once you engage, game on. Amen? Game on. And so he looked at this giant and he said, you know what? You say we are from the armies of Saul, but you don't get it. We are actually from the armies of the living God. His brothers didn't help the situation. No. They told David to be quiet. You're just a kid. Leave us alone. You know, sometimes when we're on the brink of victory, there will be naysayers around us. Amen? You ever seen that? Naysayers among you who just as you're about to have the victory, they come in and say, no, 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 impossible. Let me share with you a personal story. For 22 years of my life, I had a severe speech impediment. I mean, I could never talk on the telephone. I could not have any conversation with anybody and not block. I was like, it was like driving a stick shift, you know what I mean? And you, you pop the clutch, you know, like that. Well, that's how I talked, or I should say, didn't talk. And when I, 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 I proposed to my wife, you know, to be married, I said, you wouldn't, what? Really? <laughs> and she in her graciousness said, yes! I guess she read the intent of my heart. And so I was plagued with this impediment for 22 years of my life. It was a literal prison. I had a conversation with, with a pastor. The conference hired me, you know that? Incredible. Mark, they hired me. 
as a student missionary for $100 a month on room and board. Now, that's the most pay I'd ever gotten, and so I took it. And my first assignment was door-to-door -door ministry. I don't care if you don't have a speech impediment. When you do door-to-door -door ministry, you're going to stutter. And so here I was at the door, you know, blocking everything. The people would open the door and they would say, what do you want? And I'd be going, and they would close the door on me like I was some nut. And really, I was. <laughs> they weren't far off. And so I told my senior pastor, I'm done. I'm wasting the conference's money. And he said, before you go, I want you to talk to a pastor. And so I went down to Los Angeles and I had this conversation with Lloyd Wyman, who was the pastor of the White Memorial Church at that time. And he said, Gerard, if God has called you, let him take care of that problem. What do you think? What do you think? Well, I, I got into my Jeep and I drove north on Highway 14, north on Highway 14 in my Jeep. And as I was driving, I was almost at the Palmdale Church at the time, and I felt this warm sensation on my neck, and I had no idea what that was about. But I got to the church and I got out of my Jeep and I walked into the church and some members were saying to me you know what and i said why what's going on and i began talking blah, 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 and and i didn't realize what was going on and they said to me pastor you're talking i was in shock we just had a prayer meeting for you at the church and God loosed your tongue 22 years but then I went home and I talked to my father and my father said oh come on that's impossible it's a fluke see sometimes you got those naysayers in your life and sometimes they can be your parents Just a fluke. It'll never last. Forty-three years later, I guess my dad was wrong. I guess he was wrong. See, sometimes as Christians, we live our lives as if we were atheists. You know what I mean? You know, we say we believe in God, but then when push comes to shove, we deny his power. Amen. He can fix other people, but not me. I saw this guy walking on campus over at Chafee College, and he had on his hat, Jesus, with a cross. Jesus. And I thought, oh, interesting. This guy must be a Christian, right, Mark? I mean, wouldn't you think that? You know, he got a Jesus thing and a, and a cross thing. And out of his mouth, all this guy was doing was complaining about the country and complaining about the church and complaining about his neighbors and complaining. And I began to wonder, did you find that hat somewhere? Because I don't think you realize what it says on your head. So here was Goliath, big guy, like we saw. A man who was mature, had armor, had a spear, had experience, had an armor bearer, but he lacked one thing, right? You know what he lacked? He did not know God. And here was this young man, a teenager. Some say he would have to be at most 17 years old. Do we have any 17 year olds here in church here this morning? Raise your hands. Under 20, raise your hands. Under 20. 
Okay, come on, come on. Let me see you. Under 20. Okay, I'm telling you, God will use you when us old people can't see a way. Amen? Man, this was tremendous. And here, these old older people are immobilized by this intimidating foe. And here comes this teenager and calls it like it is. You are just an uncircumcised Philistine. Wouldn't you have loved to be there? I would have said to that kid, 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 tone it down a little bit. You're going to make him upset. See, but uh, Goliath had made a huge mistake. He underestimated his antagonist, didn't he? There's another way to make a huge mistake. Underestimate God. And so here they were, big giant of a man, and probably a person my height, around six feet. Now, I like to say I'm six feet, but Mark lost a few inches over time, you know, so... I could be like 5'10". Okay, but anyway, here's David with faith in God and a sling against a giant with experience and a spear. Who do you think is going to win? Well, I would like to suggest to you that Goliath had the odds that were stacked against him. You know, we say all the times, oh, how could a little boy do something like this? Well, see, we forget something about David. David was not just a shepherd. He was a what? A slinger. A slinger. You know, uh, in archaeology we learn that warfare in those days had three levels. One was the infantryman, and the next level was the archers and the slingers, and the last level was the cavalry. And so here an infantryman, Goliath, who was a big target, is coming against a slinger who in those days, it says, was able to hit a target a hair's breadth with a stone. A hair's breadth. It was like, Goliath is like a karate guy. You know what I'm saying? He's ominous, and he comes against this guy who's got a gun. Who do you think is going to win? But that was the human level. There was one more level. David, he came against this giant in the name of God. Do you hear me? In the name of God. So not only was Goliath outgunned, he was outfaithed, outfaithed. And by that I mean this. See, if David had walked up to him flexing his muscle and said, you know, Goliath, I'm going to take you down, he would have lost in a heartbeat. Saul offered him his armor. And no, 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 no. He said, uh, uh, I don't want that armor. I've got to do this battle on God's terms. And so he came there with a sling in his hand and faith in God. Because I would like to suggest to you that even though on a human level, Goliath was out, outpaced by David, what if David had missed? Hmm. 
there was only one chance to get it right. See, sometimes in our life, there's only one chance to get it right. And so it's not enough that we have the right armament. We must also carry with us faith in God. And so you've all heard the story of Hacksaw Ridge. Have you heard that story of Desmond Doss? Have you? A young man. Again, a young man who came on the field with what? With no guns. With no guns. But he came on the field with faith in God. And here's my point. What we need to remember is rather than flexing our muscles, we need to flex our faith. Isn't that incredible? And so here he was, Desmond Doss, no gun, refusing to kill anyone. Under the fire of the enemy, he rescued, some say, 80, 80 to 100 people. How did that happen? Because Desmond Doss was flexing his faith. Friends, when we come in the name of Jesus, we bring with us all of the resources of heaven. Amen. When we come in the name of Jesus, we come in the name of our creator, our sustainer, our redeemer, our friend. Sometimes in times of highest crisis, we see how that friend will come through. You know, around 14 years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer in the third stage. And I was thinking, oh boy, I've heard of other people who have had, had cancer in this stage and they're all dead. And so I was facing surgery and I asked God, you know, before I go in, I just want to know one thing. I need to know that there is an Adventist presence here in the hospital. Now you might say, why does it have to be Adventist? And my answer is, because. I was at USC. How are we going to have that? I thought, well, that's God's problem, not mine. And so I went to the blood draw. And uh, I told the guy, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. He goes, okay, great. And he belonged to the Church of God. And then all of a sudden, in the blood draw, this man walks in. And he was the man who I had dealt with in the pre-surgery. Really kind, gentle man. Well, he came looking for me in the blood draw area, and my son happened to be sitting there who was going to La Sierra University, you know, and he had the shirt, La Sierra University. And he looked at my son, and he said, La Sierra University, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? And my son said, yes, I am. Now, my wife was in the room at the time, so she will substantiate. I'm not hallucinating here. And, and so uh, 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 he said, uh, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist too. And my son said, you're a Seventh-day Adventist? I think my, my dad would like to hear that because one of the things he told me is that he wanted to have an SDA presence uh, to just oh, kind of assure him. And so he walks into the blood draw and he says, I understand that you're looking for a Seventh-day Adventist. I said, yes, I am. And I explained to him why about my prayer. And he said, well, I am a Seventh-day Adventist. And I thought, wow, 
this is incredible. And so I asked him, what's your name? And he says, my name is Garnett. Garnett? Hmm. I was the pastor of the West Covina Hills Church for nine years, and there was a Garnett there named Bertha. And, and Bertha was a good friend, a prayer partner of my mother. And he said, Bertha is my mom. Uh, can I hear an amen? When God answers prayer, he does it in a mighty way. mighty way. I didn't expect it. Not like that. And all of a sudden, I had peace over myself. And I just thought, okay, God, if you care about that little of a detail, what I am about to face is okay. And I went into that surgery with peace on my heart. In the name of Jesus, the world was made. In the name of Jesus, the Red Sea was parted. In the name of Jesus, Lazarus was resurrected. In the name of Jesus, any giant in your life can be slain in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of Jesus. What do you do with this information? When we commit ourselves to Jesus, at that moment, we become a part of a faith community. And that name and all the power behind it is ours. Isn't that incredible? It makes me just absolutely, I'm silent about it. Really? Yes. That name, in that name, all the power of heaven comes with it. Number two, rather than flex our muscles, we can then flex our faith. Number three, as a daily routine, Make it a point in your life to praise God for every breath you take. Can you do that? Amen. See, I have learned one thing, and that is do not take your breath of life for granted because it can be gone on the way home today. This is not to scare. It's to share what our predicament is like on this, on this planet. See, but in the name of Jesus, it doesn't matter if we're gone on the way home, except to our family, of course. It doesn't matter because in the name of Jesus, we will be resurrected. Amen. See, there is no more powerful name. He is our sufficiency. He is our glory. And when we are faced with giants, we need to quit telling God about how big our giants are and begin to tell our giants about the empowering presence of God in our life. Amen. Church, we are the army of the living God. There is literally nothing 
that can overcome the church. Nothing. Elder Larry Cavanis shared this promise with me that's found in Desire of Ages. I loved that man. I worked with him for 18 years, and he loved this conference. Amen? And your new president loves this conference. He does. He cares about it. However, Larry Kavanagh would read this quote over and over to us and remind us, you know, Gerard, you know, region directors, you know, ADCOM, never forget this. Whatever your anxieties and trials, spread out your case before the Lord. Your spirit will be braced for endurance. The will the way will be open for you to disentangle yourself from embarrassment and difficulty. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger will you become in his strength. The heavier your burdens, the more blessed the rest in casting them upon the burden bearer. Worry is blind and cannot discern the future but Jesus sees the end from the beginning in every difficulty he has his way prepared to bring relief our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing those who accept the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find their perplexities vanish and a plain path before their feet. Amen. Friends, I invite you to join me in this closing prayer of invitation. The prayer that says, Almighty God, why do we do it? Why do we forget about you? Why do we forget why do we focus on the giants in our lives and not on the God who creates heaven and earth? Why do we do it? Lord, help us to receive this power that you have for us and be led to see that in the name of Jesus is every power we need to overcome the giants in our lives. If you will join with me, I invite you to stand with me as we pray. Our Father God, incredible, incredible how we, we let the giants in our lives, which are just immovable targets, get in the way of intimidating us and saying to us that we are captive to them. No, no, not so. In the name of Jesus, the world was created. In the name of Jesus, the world is sustained. In the name of Jesus, we will be resurrected in the name of Jesus. We are made whole in the name of Jesus. We come against every giant in our lives. And in that name, we overcome. Lord, we stand in your presence as your people, knowing that the strength that resides within us is a strength of trust and faith in you. It's not about what we can do. It's about who we can trust. And we trust you, O oh Father. Let us live each day with the understanding and the recognition that you will never leave us nor forsake us. That even though we don't see, you are there in the darkness of our lives and you will create light where there is no vision because you are God.
Lord, there are young people among us who are the slingers that you have called. I pray for each one of them, Lord. Help them to lead the church in a new understanding of who you are. We thank you so much for this truth. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Let's turn to our closing hymn at this time.
unto him who's able to do in surpassing ways more than what we can imagine or think. Unto him be glory and honor and power. Lord, let us live this week in your presence. Let us know, God, that we are yours and we are your children. And with that name of Jesus, we have power to share the good news with others. Let us share that news, Lord, so they too may experience the goodness of your love. May we walk on in faith with you, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.